upstream, oh life givers, swimming upstream, I see you thriving. Hello, everyone. My name is Erica Lundahl. I am the, the Conservation Impact Manager for Mountaineers Books. Thank you for joining us today for our Be Well virtual series. Um, our event today is Return of the Salmon, the Human Connection. Mountaineers Books is located on Coast Salish territories in Seattle, Washington. And our books about the outdoors tell stories across the land of hundreds, if not thousands of indigenous peoples. We'd like to acknowledge the place-based knowledge of these peoples and are grateful for their ancestral and current stewardship of these lands that we cherish so deeply. Tonight's event will feature a guided dialogue hosted by Mindy Roberts from Washington Environmental Council between Joseph Pavel, the Director of Natural Resources for the Skokomish Indian Tribe and writer Adrian Ross Scanlon, author of Turning Homeward, Restoring Hope and Nature in the Urban Wild, published by Mountaineers Books. It's a journey of a newcomer to the Pacific Northwest who learns that home isn't simply where you live, but where you create belonging. You'll hear about both of tonight's speakers in a moment from Mindy. Uh, tonight's event is co-hosted by Mountaineers Books, a nonprofit publisher of award-winning books about the outdoors, conservation, and sustainability lifestyle for the last 60 years. And We Are Puget Sound was published by Braided River, the conservation arm of Mountaineers, in collaboration with Washington Environmental Council. As a 501c3 mission-driven nonprofit, we invest in and bring to life powerful books and stories like We Are Puget Sound and Turning Homeward that connect and root us deeply to the natural world. And Washington Environmental Council, our partner, is a nonprofit statewide advocacy organization that's been driving positive change to solve Washington's most critical environmental challenges since 1967. Uh, today's event, feel free to use the chat feature when you have questions for Adrian um, or for Joseph or Mindy. And, um, but we, we would love for you to use the Q&A option um, actually. Um, and we'll be monitoring as we go. We'll have about 35 minutes of presentation and then Q&A. And on that note, I am delighted to have the opportunity opportunity to introduce you to Mindy Roberts. Um, I have had the pleasure of working with Mindy over the last couple of years on this um, on this book and on our advocacy campaign to protect Puget Sound and its waters and wildlife and the health of our communities. So thank you so much, Mindy. Thank you, Erica, and thank you everyone for joining us on a, where I am at least a particularly blustery evening, uh, but we are glad to have you with us. I am going to take over your screen here momentarily. Let me get set up. All right, here we go. Um, tonight, uh, I am here on behalf of an enormous cast of characters who were involved in the development of, of We Are Puget Sound, including some incredibly talented writers, a number of photographers, including Brian Walsh and the very talented folks at, at Braided River. Um, so I am one of an ensemble cast and, and just wanted to acknowledge all of the remarkable work that these, these folks did. Erica also mentioned um, the, the Coast Salish peoples. I am joining you from uh, the lands of the Tulalip, Stiligwamish, and the Suquamish uh, people where I am. So let's begin a little bit with an overview, maybe grounding on, on where, where Puget Sound came from. What was the, what was the concept behind it? I think a number of folks are following the decline of orcas in our region. Um, environmental indicators that um, show us that not all is well. And this generated a whole lot of interest as the, um, as the orca numbers were, were declining and our region got together over the past several years to start thinking about, okay, what's it gonna take to reverse the declines of orcas? But it turns out that the same stressors that impact orcas, the lack of salmon and too much toxic pollution impacts people as well. Um, and in fact, tribal people who, whose ancestors have been here since time immemorial um, are also impacted by the lack of salmon um, and the lack of toxic pollution as well. And sometimes it seems a bit overwhelming to figure out how are we going to uh, make progress on these issues and the salmon crisis in particular. And as we, we looked a little bit deeper, we realized there's, there's a number of people in our communities that are doing really good work. 
um, at lots of different scales, lots of different places using lots of different tools. And it's really inspiring to, to hear their stories uh, about what they're doing and why they're doing it. Uh, but all of that is driven by a, a particular love of place. It's a connection with place, it's a connection with, with wildlife, and it's also a connection with people as well. So with that, let's take a, a virtual tour since, uh, since we're, we're pretty much stuck inside right now. Um, but the, the Salish Sea region begins at the crest of the Cascade Range and the Olympic Range as well, um, where uh, great snows gather, forming glaciers in, in some places. And those alpine areas are a critical part of the larger Salish Sea region. They're home to iconic creatures uh, like the pika here, and they're also a playground for people. I think F, one of the maybe upsides of, of COVID, if, if there is one at all, is that people realize just how much, uh, how important it is to spend time outside. And it isn't a, a luxury. It's, it's really a way for our, um, for us to connect with other people and to connect with places around us and really kind of, kind of be patch of it as well. But those Alpine areas are just playgrounds for people. Um, and I hope uh, we are able to get back into those areas safely uh, soon so we can start enjoying people's company again. The Salish Sea region is really defined by water from the mountain, mountain snows and, and glaciers on through the lowland forests where the precipitation drops off of needles from, from Douglas fir trees here and gathers in great torrents of water. Um, water and, and wood that deliver um, nutrients to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, but that's not a one-way cycle. Um, that is also the, um, the lifeblood of salmon in our region. So the salmon that are coming back to spawn today um, grew fat in the Pacific Ocean over the past three to five years, and they're bringing their nutrients back with them to fertilize uh, their, their natal streams, um, to give life to the next generation of salmon as well. And they really are this amazing connector um, in, in the environment and a way to connect us with all sorts of other places um, around the, the Pacific coast as well. The salmon have, have sustained people for millennia in our area, but it's more than a food source. And I, I hope we'll get a chance to hear a little bit more about um, how important it is to as a, as a, as a foundational animal, but a, but a way of drawing people together as well. Um, but people have relied on salmon as a, as a connection um, for, million, or for, th for thousands of years. And some people may have ancestors that have not been here for thousands of years, but are drawing new connections into our community now and maybe re-engaging with, with backyard parks, uh, backyards or parks in their communities. I saw there was a pretty serious uptick in birding um, this, this past uh, six months or so, just because people are spending time outside now, um, not with each other, we can't get this close right now, um, but uh, enjoying the natural environment. And we're most familiar with the land, that's, that's where we, we spend most of our time, but shoreline areas at the, kind of at the edge of the land and, and connecting us with the, the lands, uh, with the waters of Puget Sound are incredibly important in terms of biodiversity. Um, as, a, as a nursery zone, uh, zone for young salmon. And the shorelines are also home to their own iconic creatures here. So here's the mink, a little bit more reclusive than, than other animals that you see in the intertidal zone. Um, but under the water, life continues. Um, the sea stars uh, that you see here that were once so incredibly numerous all over went through their own cycle of, of decline with sea star wasting disease several years ago and all up and down the, the west coast of North America. Not many people get to view a uh, lion's mane jellyfish from a, from a fish eye view here, but we're really fortunate to have uh, quite talented photographers sharing these images with us um, through We Are Puget Sound. Um, and creatures like the giant Pacific octopus uh, that draws divers from all over the world uh, to come see these remarkable creatures. And we're less familiar with these images, fewer people get to see them. Um, and unfortunately, that means we're less familiar with some of the damage that our landside activities are doing to the marine ecosystem. This is a still image that was captured from a video of a stormwater pipe discharging into Puget Sound. And that black cloud there is, is all of the gunk that builds up on our roadways, oil and grease and, and, uh, and sediment and toxic pollution as well. And unfortunately, most of that goes directly into Puget Sound without being treated 
uh, first. And that means it's delivering it into the sound where it is taken up by fish um, and possibly eaten by people as well. So these changes that we've made to the landscape around the Salish Sea were, were done for economic benefits. We, we cut down forests to build our homes, um, to power early economy in our area, but those have had some unintended consequences, including for our salmon habitat. And it's hard to convince some, sometimes, uh, some people sometimes that there's actually problems with Puget Sound because not a lot of people see the damage. But if you ever see a, a sheen, an oil sheen on a roadway, um, that's a good example of something that eventually will probably make it down into Puget Sound where it's, it can be harmful to, uh, to life and under the water. And those problems are going to take some pretty serious solutions in the coming years. And there are 17 different profiles of, of uh, people and, and groups of people in uh, We Are Puget Sound that are really inspiring. I mentioned before, they're doing remarkable work in their communities. They are making a difference. Um, and uh, we wanted to bring you their stories um, in hopes of connecting um, with those stories. Uh, right now, we're not able to connect in person, we're, we're uh, behind glass from each other, in this case, a, a computer monitor. Um, and we're, I think we're all looking forward to, to being able to spend more time directly um, with each other. Again, I think we're, we're now realizing um, not being around each other has some, has some pretty serious impacts as well, but we cannot do that safely now um, and still protect public health in our area. We Are Puget Sound really is about the future. If, if we look around the, the region that we live in today, where we work, where we go to school, the, what we see here and what we experience is based on decisions that were made years and decades ago. And now it's up to us to make some decisions over the coming years that will really determine the conditions that this little girl grows up in. And I know I personally would love for her to experience the joy of seeing an orca. Um, in Puget Sound. There's so very few places around the world where you can see something like that from a downtown area. Um, I'd love to see her experience thriving or, uh, salmon runs. I'd like, love her to see vibrant rural communities. Um, all of these things will take decisions, um, intentional decisions to make sure that we leave this place just a little bit better than we found it. Um, and uh, uh, it is about the leaving a legacy for future generations. We'll talk about this a little bit more after you get to meet Joseph and, and Adrian, but the We Are Puget Sound um, campaign includes 10 different actions that you can take uh, personally to make a difference um, for Puget Sound. And we'll talk a little bit more um, later about supporting tribal treaty rights. And what does that mean um, for everyone who lives in the state of Washington? But with that, I wanted to turn to introduce our two guests tonight. Um, Joseph Favel grew up digging clams and oysters and fishing for salmon in the Skokomish River as a member of the Skokomish Indian tribe, the people of the river. He earned a fisheries science degree at the University of Washington, uh, worked with the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission, and now serves as director of natural resources for the Skokomish Indian tribe. He's responsible for developing and implementing the tribe's work on water quality, environmental health, hazardous waste, habitat protection, and enhancement programs for salmon bearing streams and wetlands. So that is a whole lot of work and we're really grateful that you can spend time with us tonight, Joseph. Our second guest is Adrian Ross Scanlon, who is a writer, a restoration volunteer, an urban and now a suburban naturalist uh, and a former citizen scientist monitoring local, local salmon streams. And she wrote about these adventures in her book, Turning Homeward, Restoring Hope and Nature in the Urban Wild which was a Washington State Book Award 2017 finalist. Um, so welcome to both of you. Thank you very much for talking about the human connections with salmon. We have a series of questions for, for Joseph and for Adrienne. Um, and meanwhile, if you have other questions that you'd like to ask, if you can use the, the Q&A um, function at the bottom of your screen. If you can't find that, use the chat function and we'll work on that as well. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that you can see them. Uh, a little bit more closely. So thank you again uh, for joining us. Um, and Joseph, we realize you have a lot going on in your world. That was an incredible portfolio of responsibility and we're very thankful to have you here. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your, your connection with the Skokomish River and the Hood, and Hood Canal as a, as a tribal member? Yeah, you left out the fisheries management and the shelter management as well, but that's only a small part of my job. Um, 
you know, uh, I'm, I'm a member of the Skokomish Indian tribe. I, uh, I am here uh, working for the tribe in the capacity of the natural resources director. And we're a small tribe and we have limited, but a very talented and dedicated group of folks, um, you know, just committed to our work and our mission. And uh, I like to say, you know, when I, when people ask me why you do this, well, I'm on a mission. I am committed, and uh, I I know that uh, that takes a whole whole body of people. All these people here, all those folks out there on the landscape, all those NGOs, all those local government, state government agencies, federal government, federal government agencies, and so that's uh, you know that's our job, and I'm I'm here to speak on behalf of the resource as a tribal member, as a, as a truly blessed by our creator to have these resources. We could talk about that, the gifting of these resources to the tribe, these fish, these games, these plants, these homelands, these waters. You know, those are all things that we are forever and every day, and as we are taught by our ancestors to always be thankful for and recognize that we accept our responsibility here. You know, to take care of those resources and, and the beauty of the gift of these resources that sustain our life, that feed our, bi our body, our mind, and our spirit, that fuel our subsistence. And these are our sustainable resources. These are perpetual, given the proper care and stewardship that we accept and and embrace that responsibility, which is what we bring to the table. And, and that's why I'm here. It's part of that responsibility is to constantly educate those that are ignorant of what we have here and of what it takes to sustain and how to be committed and caring to those resources. That's why I'm here and that's what I speak to. Well, thank you. Well, what was the question? <laughs> well, how, how about this? Um, you're uh, in, the, in the profile in We Are Puget Sound, you talk about the, um, the moods of Hood Canal um, and, and your joy in, in being out on the water. So your, your connection with that. Um, and I'm curious what, what you meant by moods or, or your connections with the waters. Well, uh, it's, it's part of this earth that is part of this system and it's alive. It's, it's another one of our communities that we share this world with. Um, and it demonstrates that. Uh, we can see that, you know, and, and it's just a, a, a awesome and rewarding to on a, on a really uh, blustery day to just uh, take that in from that perspective, as well as the more calm and the serene side of, of that environment. So. I think what we got to say is that we just love and appreciate all the facets of that, whatever a day it brings to us, whether it be harsh, cold, blustery, blowing, rainy day, and just to say, another beautiful day in the great Northwest. And, and I know I say this, and during those good times of the year, during those summers, we got those beautiful, beautiful, the skies are never bluer. And we know that we appreciate that. We don't have, we don't 
we don't have the live that every day. We get to learn and enjoy the contrast. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, and uh, turning to Adrienne, welcome. And you're a more recent transplant to our region. A little bit less, or a little bit less time here, but um, can you tell us a little bit more about what, what drew you here? Uh, I wonder if any, any common uh, themes that you, you saw from, from Joseph and his connections. Thank you. Um, what drew me here is kind of a long and complicated story that's best told in my book, so I won't go into that in detail right now. Um, it did involve the very painful death of a parent and the subsequent need to change my life in a very significant way. So to make a long story short, I came out to Seattle. I knew very little about it when I came here. Most of what I knew um, were stories that I'd heard when I was growing up in New York State about how in the Pacific Northwest, the rivers were so thick with salmon that you could walk from one side of the river to the other, just walking across the backs of these fish. Um, so those are the stories. And then when I came here, I started hearing some other stories about salmon, very different stories. People were still talking about salmon, but they were talking about them as if it was like an old family ghost. So the fish were appearing and they were disappearing. And people would talk about how they used to go down to a certain stream and they'd see the salmon, but the stream was now diverted underneath a shopping mall or a parking lot where they would talk about how they used to go fishing and they'd catch coho and chinook and sockeye and how big those fish used to be. So it was story after story after story. And I got more and more curious as I kept hearing these stories. So one day I found myself um, signing up for a Sierra Club field trip to go see a salmon spawning stream one fall. It was Cottage Lake Creek which at the time and probably still does, it flows alongside horse farms and some pretty upscale housing developments. Um, and what I'd like to do if I could is just read very briefly from the first, cha first chapter of Turning Homeward about what it was like to see those salmon for the first time, to see the fish as opposed to the stories. The sockeye had lost the sleek silvery fitness of their ocean phase. Now in mating colors, their bodies were crimson and gleaming in the swift, clear water. The deep green of their heads appeared almost pagan. The males seemed humpbacked, their snouts descended into hooks. Sakai pressed their bodies close to their mates, their tails quivering in rapid, intense bursts. In the last fierce instincts of their lives, the Sakai lunged for deeper water or slashed at nearby fish. The fins of most of the sockeye were pale and their bodies were dotted with a patchwork of white fungus which heralded their deaths. I leaned on the footbridge railing. I stared at the sockeye. I had a strange feeling of awe and incomprehension. I was being called to witness, but what was I seeing? The Pacific Northwest, I'd heard it said many times, many times, was anywhere there were salmon, but what were these fish to me? Years later, I would understand that what I saw that day was the creature that would guide me into turning a strange place into a home. Well, thank you, uh, Adrian. And, and as we were talking um, last week and kind of preparing for this, I, I know you, you mentioned how the, um, it gave you a sense of uh, seasons, um, which was something that you had missed from New England. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, about that? And, and, you know, we do officially have two seasons, rainy and not rainy, um, but it sounds yeah. like you needed a little bit more. Well, um, that was pretty confusing. I will say that it was very disorienting that first couple of years that I was here. And one way that I started to get a sense of this place was by searching out salmon streams and also just finding my way around as for that. In terms of the seasons, what I will say about that, as a result of all these different journeys to finally see some salmon streams every fall. And again, I'm reading from Turning Homewards. Uh, I think this is the third chapter, the Ellsworth Creek chapter. An inner geography was taking shape to match the landscape my first years in Seattle were a disorienting stretch of rain and gray skies from September to May. I waited in vain for the seasons of the Northeast that I knew so well. 
an autumn of crimson and purple leaves, of brisk winds and bright days that hardened into winter snow, gleaming in starlight, and air so cold it burned my lungs, only to warm in time with spring roses unfurling to gleam and then slowly wither away as summer's bright sun faded with the coming fall. As I learned to look past Seattle's rain and see the return of the salmon as a sign that a distinct time of year had begun, I became aware of other animal migrations marking my new home. Winter was when red-tailed hawks perched atop highway street lamps. Spring was when the turtles called red-eared sliders emerged from hibernation and sunned along on, on logs along the shores of some of Seattle's busiest parks. It felt like an old fashioned way of learning about a place mm -hmm. as if I had entered my new home through the back door. Thanks for, for sharing that with your experience in, uh, in Seattle, which is a vastly different uh, environment than, um, than Hood Canal and the and Skokomish River. Um, and Joseph, we started off by talking about how the, um, I think people think of salmon, maybe they learn about it first as, as a food supply, but you know, clearly it was, um, its importance goes well beyond that for um, the Skokomish tribe. And um, could you could you tell folks a little bit more about that reserving that right to fish and shellfish in the 1855 Treaty of Point No Point and, and why that was so critical for, for the tribe? Well, the people, our ancestors, those that were called upon to engage in those tree talks, you know, they knew the importance of these resources to sustain our, our people and our way of life. And, and that was fundamental to some of the words that were put into this treaties. Um, they were faced with the awesomely difficult decision. And uh, this is one of the few things that we were able to um, reserve, you know. Uh, you know, I say that, uh, you know, it's, it's maybe not clear and obvious to the average person, but these, these treaties are, are not a, a grant to tribes. This is the tribes granting vast swaths of land to the federal government and reserving some essential component to that to the best of our ability at that time. And also with some minor um, obligations from the federal government, which every day we struggle to um, have those um, honored, what we call the treaty rights, uh, um, but on the so, you know, certainly as a food item um, and, it, and, as, and as a support to our people, as a focus for a lot of our activities, as far as our preparations and our ceremony and our gathering of our people and our families to engage in these activities uh, to being able to, you know, it was a valuable commodity. It was also a trade commodity and it, it put us in a position to have, you know, dialogue and exchange with, with those uh, others that were not so privileged to have this particular resource, but might have another one. So it, uh, it was a foundation of trade across the nation. You know, uh, I think it's an error that a lot of people think that these natives were not actually, you know, just isolated in their little enclaves, but it was a, a vast and vibrant and a, a community and, and a network across this nation before the decimation that was brought upon us. We see these tribe, we can trace these trade items from coast to coast. We see the uh, we see the um, artifacts 
of these civilizations that have occupied this this uh, land that are now no longer here. You know, we have a a small population in these current times, but you know, the estimates of the native population of this country and, and of this continent range from numbers of 25 to 200 million. Mm -hmm. And even here in Hook Canal, where our few tribes that are based here are in the few thousand, perhaps, you know, historic numbers, of, you know, of, of, you know, orders of magnitude greater than that. But that's another thing. So it was important that we, that we, honored and respected this resource because we did have, you know, large populations of people that rely on it, uh, respected it, that brought us together as community and as family and as and, uh, and our ceremony and our practices and our abilities to engage with our neighboring tribes on throughout the Northwest and, and across the nation. Thank you. And um, I recall you talking at last year's Tribal Habitat Conference about all of the work that the tribe has been doing to restore mm -hmm. habitat in the um, freshwater areas and the marine environment as well. And and I, I remember I can't remember how you said it, Joseph, but it was it was basically that this it, this has taken years to decades uh, to do this because the impacts have grown over over decades as well. Um, how, what, what are some of the changes that you're seeing as a result of the recovery actions and how, it, how is that, um, how, how are people in Skokomish um, viewing that? Well, we see that as, you know, going on 200 years of exploitation of the resources and, and uh, attempts to dominate and subdue the the landscape to whatever ends might serve whoever was doing all of those things. Um, you know, our, our people were either those that um, managed to survive were placed on these reservations and so forth or other small communities and and even those were broken up to, to whatever end. So um, this ability to reinstate our traditional practices of, of this you, you, ability to have a share of, and use that share of these resources to our purposes um, brought us together, but it, and, and at a time when that resource was declining and declining. And so uh, the people were saying, you know, we need to uh, fix this. So we have the support of the people and, and it means to them that, you know, to try to exercise, you know, people think that you say we're up exercising a, a treaty right to protect and restore the resource. But I think it's a, it's a higher calling than that. And, and I don't like to refer to it or use it as a treaty right. I don't, I'm not gonna roll the treaty up here. I, I think it's a higher calling and, and that's what I respond to. And, and that's what the people are calling on us to, to live up to our obligations here. And how are the, how are the fish numbers doing in the Skokomish River and nearby? Well, that's unfortunate that I think uh, the mainstay of our fisheries, the chum salmon fishery, for a second year in a row has crashed after several years of being quite healthy and bountiful. Um, the last two years, uh, uh, we're seeing the crash and it's got us all wondering, you know, and certainly we're aware of conditions in the ocean and the blob and those things. And it's hard not to, uh, you know, connect those events. So we're looking at that one. How do we, how are we going to deal with? It? We deal with what we got here, and we're, we're working on the landscape. You know, we do gravel to gravel management, and right now we're just working on the gravel. 
And then there's a whole environment, a whole life cycle outside of that. But right now we're, we're you know, here was say, say within the watershed and even on the shores of the Hood Canal, we're, we're only able and have only the capacity to be focused on the gravel. And there's a whole world out there. These fish live in a whole, they, they have a whole world that, that, they, that they utilize outside of just this gravel. So much has to has to go right for for them to to survive uh, and and thrive both in the area around our part of the world and you mentioned the blob out in the Pacific Ocean. Um, thanks for sharing that. Um, and and Adrian in the urban environment, that's another great yeah. example of uh, human development has had some impacts. The the salmon salmon runs have crashed in in most urban areas um, around the Puget Sound region, um, but. I know you work a bit on what, what people can do um, yes. in urban and, and suburban areas as well. Um, and for folks looking for things that they can achieve themselves, what, what are some of those activities? I, whenever anyone asks me about what they can do about salmon streams in urban and suburban areas, even though there's so much that can be done, I mean, learning about tribal rights as we're doing tonight is very important and engaging youth and engaging diverse communities. But always the first thing that comes to my mind is we have to stop stormwater runoff going into local creeks and streams and going into Puget Sound. And that is very much an urban and a suburban problem. It's something that I saw firsthand when I was monitoring salmon at Longville Creek. Um, you know, it wasn't all that long ago that when it rained in Puget Sound, the rain would fall on cedars or dug fir or other kinds of conifers. It would seep down onto salmonberry and snowberry and other shrubs. And then from there, it would seep into the ground and then drain out to Puget Sound or local creeks and streams as groundwater, as fresh groundwater. And now, you know, as we mentioned earlier in the webinar, it rains in Puget Sound and more often than not, the rain hits a city street, it hits a concrete sidewalk, it hits some kind of impervious surface. And what's on that surface? Gasoline, motor oil, pesticides and fertilizers that have poured off people's front lawns, all of that kind of gets picked up by the rain and all that shoots straight into Puget Sound or into local creeks and streams. And Mindy, you know uh, what the current readings are more than better than I do, but my understanding is that about 75% of the pollution hitting Puget Sound is coming from stormwater runoff. So this is very, and also, um, and again, this is something that I saw at Longfellow Creek and at other urban creeks when I was monitoring them, this is decimating coho salmon runs in urban and suburban areas. Coho runs in the rural areas are, you know, they're, they're holding steady, they're doing okay. But when coho come into an urban stream or a suburban stream that's been poisoned by stormwater runoff, that water is so toxic that the coho die within sometimes just one, one or two hours before they have a chance to mate, before they have a chance to put down that next generation of salmon. So they're dying before they can, they can reproduce. Um, so stormwater runoff, that is, that is literally a problem in the backyard of urban and suburban areas. And there's a solution that is also literally in the backyard of, you know, backyard, the schoolyard, the community centers, what have you of urban areas. And that is rain gardens. Rain gardens are specially designed gardens that capture the rain, diverts it into the ground, so it doesn't hit the impervious surfaces and it never becomes stormwater runoff. Um, I think it was last spring, the We Are Puget Sound campaign did a fabulous video on rain gardens, what they are, how to install them. There are a lot of municipalities now that will give private homeowners or landowners rebates or financial assistance if they're working with a certified rain garden contractor or some certified installer of rain gardens. Um, I would really urge anyone who wants an effective, affordable way of cleaning up Puget Sound and something as simple as literally that you can put in your front yard or your backyard to take a look at that webinar. It was absolutely fabulous. Great, right, well, thank, thank you for that. And I, um, I particularly appreciate it because I find that when most people think about salmon recovery and what we need to do. It's always in terms of what the other person uh, needs to do. And, uh, and often, frankly, that's in rural communities. And, and 
I feel like that just doesn't seem fair. Uh, urban areas have decimated their own stocks through these unintended impacts from development. Um, so just maybe a larger scale question is, uh, why should people who live in an urban area do something? What, what obligation do they have? I, every single day, salmon are swimming through the daily life of, of urban and suburban residents, whether they realize it or not. I live in the greater Seattle area. Most of my water is coming from the Cedar River Waterway, which is home to a major sockeye salmon run. Most of my electricity is coming from hydroelectric dams on the Skagit River, which is home to multiple different salmon runs. So absolutely, there's an obligation that we have, those of us who love living in cities, as I do, um, to understand where we live and the impact of our actions and to turn our concern for this place, our love of being here into some kind of positive action. Um, you know, there is an obligation, but there's a flip side of that obligation. There's something that's living and breathing alongside of it that is of enormous benefit to all of us. Um, a lot of what we call restoration, environmental restoration, I think is just citizenship. That's really how I think of it. It is, it's a common commitment to understand where we live and to take care of the place that we live. Every time I volunteer at, a, at a, any kind of a restoration project, I meet people that I otherwise would never have met in just in the course of my daily life. Restoration, citizenship, it's nonpartisan. It's a common ground. It creates a shared community. Um, a lot of people, and I certainly include myself in this, just feel this overwhelming grief at what is happening to their local environment, their local community, what is happening to Puget mm -hmm. Sound, what's happening to our country, what's happening to our world. Whatever you do, whether it's planting a tree or putting in a rain garden or monitoring a salmon stream or whatever it, it is, it's an opportunity to take that grief and turn it into gratitude for the thousands of people who are out there, many different people from many different communities doing different things, but all of them living out a shared commitment to take care of this place that we call home. So is there an obligation? Yes, but I'd say there's an inspiration there too. Well, thank, and thank you for, for drawing that connection and, and talking about power because as a resident of Tacoma, one of my power sources is in the Skokomish watershed and in the usual customary areas of, of uh, uh, of uh, the Skokomish tribe. Um, yeah. So, and let's talk more about tribal treaty rights. Um, uh, Joseph, the, I, the, the action that we have is supporting tribal treaty rights. And when I uh, was working on the, the, the future of Salish Sea recovery with, with Chairman uh, Leonard Forsman from the Suquamish tribe, and we, we talked about that wording because it's not like we get a choice to support tribal treaty rights. Tribal treaty rights is like, it's the law of the land. You, you don't have an action campaign that I support gravity. Gravity just is. Um, and I, I think that's where um, the reason why it's, it's in the 10 actions is that supporting tribal treaty rights truly is about, it's integral to recovering the entire health of the Salish Sea region and all of its people. We, we can't, we can't su succeed in this and leave, leave some communities behind. So last, last words for you, Joseph, for, for non-tribal people who are watching this, um, what are some things that, um, that I could do, that, that other people can do to support you, to support the Skokomish tribe, to support tribal treaty rights in general? Uh, well, interesting to can you take note of that, that a few of the things we uh, constantly deal with here one of the questions I see had reference to septic systems and so forth, but it's also other sources of uh, uh, fecal inputs into our, our waters, which foul them. And, and now, like I said, we, we have, you know, you talk about the traditional knowledge and stuff and how that relates, but I think, um, you know, one of the fundamental elements of uh, a lot of those teachings is you don't foul your water. You respect your water. You keep it clean. And so that's one thing. Uh, we have cattle literally in the streams doing what 
cows do to a great volume. And so that's uh, and uh, one issue that we are struggling with. Uh, we call upon Department of Ecology, uh, our local county Department of Health, and and they certainly acknowledge and respect that yes, those things are wrong, but then where's the will to uh, correct those things? I think it, I think there has to become a critical mass to that voice that we need to, you know, I think that's pretty basic is to quit fouling the water. Yeah. And another step along that way is we have several different approaches of how to protect that water. So one of the initiatives we've been engaged in recently is to try to uh, develop some consistency amongst the agencies, uh, the state and the agencies that, that have those authorities to manage those shores of those waterways and, and try to uh, bring those land uses into a, a practice that will respect uh, the water quality and the environment and the habitats that our resources depend upon. Uh, another thing uh, that we're certainly challenged with right now at this time, particularly, and, and I think we have until November 16th to write a comment, but if you have the time, the Army Corps of Engineers is proposing to pass a whole slew of uh, revisions to their permitting processes which they're one of our trustee agencies. They're a federal agency and they are instrumental as a branch of the federal government who this treaty we have is with the federal government. So with the United States of America and every employee and every agency of the United States of America is obligated to honor that treaty. That's right. What they're doing within this effort to uh, revise their permitting process is to blanket just roll back all the work that has been done to try to implement some some standards and some um, sense of caring for the environment into these uh, use regulations and uh, things like you know there's an exemption for up to you know a nationwide permit which is kind of a you know a rubber stamp permit that you can you could have uh, some sort of a oil pipeline for 500 feet, 500 linear feet. And that would be probably more for local commercial or domestic purposes like a gas station or something that you would, but they propose to extend that to 250 miles. So you could put in a pipeline with no extra permitting other than to fill in a, a check box in a rubber stamp form, that kind of thing they're trying to allow nowadays. Um, you know, I know they've done a recent body of work about near shore habitats and, and we continue to be, you know, we, we know that our, you know, as well as our watersheds and the rivers and the riparian uh, areas of these uh, waterways, the near shore habitat, the, the riparian environment of our marine waters and, and shores, is important to protect, but the, you know, people continuing to put in the, the bulk heads and bell houses out over what would have been water or tidelands and, and uh, docks and, and continue to put in boats and, and mooring buoys and, and floats and rafts and, and whatever else they could put in the water. And those things got to stop. Thank you, Joseph. Um, and thank you uh, both for uh, all of your uh, wisdom here. I think we've got some questions that are coming in from folks who are attending. And if, uh, if other people wanna add your, your questions down below, we'll, um, I'm gonna poke through those and find, a, uh, find some good questions for, um, for Joseph and, and Adrian. Um, Adrian, I do see one question to you. Um, do you know of any initiatives to push greening um, roof curbside gardening, et cetera, in Seattle, um, and maybe for folks who live outside of Seattle, any other programs? I would say um, two things. First, when the webinar is over, go to 12,000 rain gardens, and I believe it's 12,000 rain gardens, 
www.ghostsofthecoast.org. Um, and they have a pretty comprehensive listing of rain garden assistance programs, resource libraries, listings of communities that give rebates. And I am reasonably sure the last time I was on the site, what I, I think is that they also have resources or at least links out to depaving organizations. In fact, there's depave, I think it's depave.org. Um, and other ways of connecting into green roof and, and similar projects. Um, I hate to do this, but the appendix of Turning Homeward does have a listing of resources for depaving, for green roofs, for rain gardens. Um, but I would say probably the best place to start with would be 12,000raingardens.org. You could also try TILS. And Mindy, I'm, I would be willing, more than willing to bet that the We Are Puget Sound campaign, you've got some resources as well to talk about. So. Yeah, so those are great resources and, and we, will, we will add them. We've got some resource page under action on our website, but um, thanks for, for flagging those. Um, Joseph, back, back to you. We had a, a more, more interest in the Army Corps uh, regs that you mentioned. Um, is, and I, I wasn't clear if that was a government to government consultation with you or is there a public process underway and how can people get involved? That is the public comment period that's engaged right now. They, they bypass the government to government consultation. Uh, yeah. Okay, so federal, always fun to find things in the federal register. Any, any suggestions for, for keywords? Nationwide permit, what's the- Nationwide what the permit? permit, probably. Remember what the permit number is? Oh God, there's I can't, so many. I don't others. remember off the top of my head. Okay. <laughs> Four no different problem. bundles of them. There's nationwide permit, uh, okay. 48. And I think that has to do with shoreline stuff and 460 for water quality. And I think maybe, uh, yeah, I'd have to look through the ocean. Um, the Army Corps side, I don't have any of that stuff right on hand here with me right now. They don't, they don't make it easy to find, uh, that's for sure. But let's see if we can find some resources if, if folks I want could to. I can probably forward you some of the comment letters we submitted right now if you want me to. <laughs> That'd be great, yeah. And if folks want to reach out to me, I'm, I'm happy to, to be a, a connector there. Well, or if other folks know how to get involved, st stick things in the chat would be, would be terrific. Um, and then, Joseph, there was one more clarification about the... Um, uh, reading your profile in the book and you, you do talk about septic problem and working with property owners to raise awareness and, and you, you just talked about that a little bit. Um, uh, there's this person saying we have a big challenge with septic systems affecting waters in Thurston County too. Are you getting anywhere on this issue for Hood Canal? Um, come back to the party. I was looking at my email okay. for something <laughs> to show you guys. Uh, uh, yeah, septic systems and that sort of thing. Um, I guess I think I commented back to one of the guys. You know, the, the, we've used this pick program, and, and I think we've had some success in isolating and identifying some problem areas and been able to get the county engaged to convince people to to correct those. I believe there are some resources out there that are available to to folks to assist them in and correcting those particular spots. Uh, uh, you know, hook, you know, here at the mouth of the river because because of the agricultural and the fields and the you know the cattle and so forth and probably some of the failing systems up on up on the, on the floodplain. Uh, whenever we have a, a flood event, they they do close down at the mouth of the river, but um, we have over the years um, been able to or sampling and, and so forth, being able to recover some of that. So we've shifted that conditioning of that so that at least it could be open for part of the year. Uh, we've had some success, uh, I think, in isolating some of the, another good shellfish bed that has been uh, prohi and prohibited status. I think we're on the verge of being able to get that one, uh, you know, maybe conditionally approved. Um, so those are the yeah, a couple of things and but yeah there there there's opportunity and and we've had some success uh, but you gotta you know 
put in the effort and the, in the county and the Department of Health and the, and the Department of Ecology, our position to be able to, to do that technical work and have to kind of point them in the right direction and keep um, um, leaning on them to get them to do that kind of work. Well, and, and I think a, a theme from, from both of you is that this work is never going to be done. We, we will keep doing it, but then again, uh, a lot of things we work on are, are never done necessarily, but it is about constant vigilance. Um, and we do know what the answers are uh, for resolving these issues and we need to figure out how, how do we do those faster? How do we do them better? Um, and I uh, just wanted to say thank you for, for both of you to um, sharing your wisdom and, and joining us uh, on our We Are Puted Sound webinar. We, we're not a highly um, produced show or anything, but just hearing from you directly is incredibly valuable and we're, we're really grateful um, that both of you could spend some time with us tonight. So I am going to uh, steal folks screens one more time um, and talk a little bit more about the actions. Um, and go ahead and get that going again. Um, I mentioned the, the campaign is, uh, it includes 10 different actions that you can take. And there's more information on our website about what that looks like, including some things like vote um, in the elections. And I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, voter turnout, of course, set records. Um, uh, this year, and I think we should just keep doing that. It's so important for, for people to vote. Um, but the one that we particularly wanted to highlight tonight is supporting tribal treaty rights. And as folks have pointed out in, in the chat, November is a Native American Heritage Month, so a really good time to do that. And a lot of, uh, a lot of salmon runs um, are, uh, are, are happening right now as well. And we wanted just to offer you some food for thought. Um, if you go to our website at um, take act at wearepudetdown.org and, and, and click on action, you'll see these four bullets. Um, earlier in the chat, somebody shared the nativeland.ca uh, link where you can find out whose land you're on. Um, and I think that really goes a long way to understanding um, uh, the, the nature of the places that we, we live and work in. Um, the understanding tribal treaty rights, that's what we wanted folks to start talking about this a little bit more. On our website, you can see a hyperlink there to the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission where they have more information on the treaties and what, what is intended by, by tribal treaty rights. Um, but the big, big issue is that people just need to be talking about this a bit more. Um, I think that uh, uh, everyone in Washington um, and people who live outside of Washington, other um, uh, people who live in other states, they're still you know, federal government, the government works for them. Um, and we need to be talking about this more because we're all parties to the treaties. Mm -hmm. um, third is uh, there are so many amazing um, tribal cultural resources and, and places that you can visit. Um, I had the opportunity to go to the Hibbul uh, Cultural Center um, earlier this year where um, they did have um, from the National Archives, the, uh, the Treaty of, of Point Elliot, and it's really, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to, to see that um, directly and then seeing how it is, is playing out today. Um, that is one of many sites, um, but there are also some really great resources online, but listening to the voices of tribal members directly on this is, is really amazing. We also wanted to mention Salmon Defense. Um, um, Salmon Defense is a 501c3 organization that was, uh, that was um, developed by um, and for the, the, the uh, Treaty Tribes of, of Western Washington. And um, it's a really great organization, terrific folks. Um, Salmon Defense is also a financial um, contributor to We Are Puget Sound. So we're really thankful for their work, um, but that's another way that you can support tribal treaty rights is by supporting organizations like Salmon Defense. So we hope you'll get a chance to, uh, to explore those resources. And um, uh, in, uh, again, on our website, you can, you can go find those uh, in person as well. Um, you can get involved in social media in, in We Are Puget Sound. We are trying to roll out different actions one at a time, maybe once a month-ish, something like that, although that, that is quite flexible. But what's really important, and, and as you heard from Joseph and from Adrian, is that there are things that all of us can do, and it's really going to take all of us uh, to turn the tide for this. And I think with that, uh, Erica, I'm turning it back over to you to talk about the uh, opportunity here. Yeah, thank you so much, Mindy. And thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Adrian. Um, I know I learned so much today um, and I hope that you did too. I'm sure that you did um, with just the um, amazing um, 
energy that we we had with everyone in the room tonight um i would um like to encourage you to check out we are puget sound the book um and turning home adrian's book which are available wherever books are sold um holidays are coming up um you know we're uh, a nonprofit, which means that um we're able to amplify the impact of of these campaigns by um uh, both a combination of philanthropy and book sales. Um, and right now, um, you can use the discount Give Books uh, on Mountaineers Books website, and you'll receive a 25% discount on any purchase through the month of November. So it's perfect for holiday shopping. And we especially also urge you to support your local bookstores. Um, we'll be sending out a recording of this presentation probably tomorrow. And I just want to encourage everyone to enjoy the outdoors in, um, in ways that are safe and authentic for you. And, you know, as we are all struggling um, and celebrating to find a senses of connection in a, um, in a fractured world, um, we'll be continuing to do these evolving We Are Puget Sound events. And you can see the previous events on the Mountaineers Books YouTube channel. So with that, I hope that you have a great rest of your evening. Thank you all for coming tonight and take care.